Well, basically, how do we learn contentment like this? And what I'd like to do is just close, and we have nine minutes to do it. Go to 1 Timothy, because this is fascinating. 1 Timothy 6 is the Apostle Paul instructing his son in the faith, Timothy. Paul is back in jail. He's in his final imprisonment, and he's instructing Timothy as the pastor of the largest church of the ancient world in Ephesus that was powerful and rich and full of material things. And he says, Timothy, this is how contentment must become a learned way of life for you. And so Paul is writing this to Timothy for Timothy to live and to teach the church. So how does contentment become a learned way of life? Well, here's the first principle, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. And the principle is this, remember that things are only temporary. You know, that's the, the first thing that we learn when we trust God is that we know that what we're so concerned with is so temporal. And so Paul says, Timothy learned that things are only temporary. He says this in verse six, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world and we can certainly carry nothing out. Wow, it's all temporary. He says, you can't take it with you. You can send it ahead. Don't don't realize that you can't take it with you. You know, it's amazing. I've I don't know what number I'm on, 300 and something funerals I've done over the last 35 years. I have never seen a little U-Haul behind the hearse. I mean, people don't do that. They don't say, well, we've got to send it with them to heaven, you know. No, you, you can't. And, and discontent will destroy our peace. It will rob us of joy. It makes us miserable. And it, it totally wrecks our witness if we're discontent. We dishonor God if we proclaim a savior who satisfies every need and then we go around discontent. Number two, look at verse eight. Here's Paul's second principle that he wanted his son in the faith. He says, you wanna unleash the power of contentment into your life and ministry, number one, realize things are temporary. Number two, only seek necessities, wait for the rest. Did you catch that? This is what he said, verse eight. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. You know, that's the one lesson I remember from the the old pastor that counseled Bonnie and me 30 years ago. As we were preparing to get married uh, in New York State, he says, you know what? He says, uh, just just get the necessities after you get married and wait for the rest. He said, don't be like all these couples that, that buy things they don't need with money they don't have and pay for them the rest of their life and they're always in debt because they're buying more stuff because they don't like the stuff and it's just like a vicious cycle. And so I remember Bonnie and I got married, moved out in our little escort to serve at Grace Community Church and in our first apartment, when we finally could afford an apartment, we went to Vaughn's and we got they were throwing them away and we got these wooden crates. Shows how old, they don't even make wooden crates anymore. We got these wooden crates and we decorated our house in vintage grape crates, you know, with boards across them. And one was our coffee table and one was, you know, the seat and and that we sat at this little table. And it was so much fun to never be in debt, ever, in our lives. We never were in debt because we started out with the necessities. You know, God always provides for the necessities. And then that man says, just save your money and, you know, then buy a car outright. You know, it's just, just Paul saying, only seek the necessities, wait for the rest. Number three, look at verse nine. Avoid a consuming desire for prosperity. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptations and many foolish and harmful lusts. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith and listen to this and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Wow. Avoid the consuming desire for prosperity. Here's the next principle, verse 11. He says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. You know what that means? Flee materialism. If, if you're pursuing godliness and love and faith and patience, you're, you're fleeing and going away from materialism because materialism deadens all those virtues. And so he says, flee materialism by pursuing righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience. Do you seek to accumulate possessions or to grow in Christ-likeness? Value what will count for eternity, Paul was telling Timothy. Here's the fifth one, cling to eternal life. He says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, verse 12. We need a whole generation of people who hold tighter to eternal life than they do to this world. 
That's, that's, that's the mark of the early church. They were clinging to eternal life, so they'd go to, to whatever God wanted them to do. Look at verse 17. Only two more. Fix your hope on God. He said, command those who are rich not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Fix your hope on God, not in uncertain riches. It's okay to have them. He doesn't say they're wrong. He said, just don't fix your hope in them. And then here's the last one. Verse 18 and 19. Principle number seven. And the principle is this. Give until it hurts. And here's what Paul said. Let them do good, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Same concept again. You know what he's saying? The real cure for materialism is giving until it hurts. Giving until it hurts means giving at a cost of personal sacrifice. Sacrifice. 